Hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, my talk's called Online Presence and Participation. And as you'll see, it, it, I, I think it carries over really, really nicely with some of the stuff that Deb was talking about. But I, I start going in a, a much different direction, as you'll, you'll soon find out. Um, before I start, I'd like to make a disclaimer. Um, while my presentation, based in fact, contains some strong opinions, and accordingly, I must state that this presentation expresses my views and should not be construed as being supported my employer, my, by my employer, the New York Public Library. So far, we have been discussing online communities intentionally developed or fostered by archives. However, we've been overlooking a key point that anyone involved with making any sort of a material available online must remember. Fundamentally, the decision to make material available online is, is a decision to participate in a community. I call this community an online community writ large. This is not a new concept, nor something over which archivists should be wringing their hands. Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the man depicted in this image, is widely known as the inventor of the World Wide Web. What became the World Wide Web was originally envisioned as a hypertext system situated for an individual institution, CERN, in Geneva, Switzerland. Much of Berners-Lee's writings explicitly framed the World Wide Web as having a social purpose by design. In his brief personal history of his involvement with the World Wide Web, Berners-Lee states that the dream behind the web is of a common information space in which we communicate by sharing information. Additionally, in his initial proposal from the World Wide Web, which dates from 1989, he writes, imagine making a large three-dimensional model with people represented by little spheres and strings between people who have something in common at work. Now imagine picking up the structure and shaking it until you make some sense of the tangle. Perhaps you see tightly, lit, tightly, tightly knit groups in some places, and in some places weak areas of communication spanned by only a few people. Perhaps a linked information system will allow us to see the real structure of the organization in which we work. If you're an archivist who was educated or trained as part of a library program, you were likely exposed to S.R. Ranganathan's Five Laws of Library Science. Ali Reza Neruzi has recast Ranganathan's Five Laws as they apply to the web. Neruzi's reframing of the first law, web resources are for use, has very real implications. That the web contains information for reuse, and that information serves no purpose if not utilized. Why are all of you in the room for this session? My guess is that you accept this fundamental supposition of the World Wide Web, that online resources of all kinds, that is, both data and documents, exist to be reused. Perhaps the anxiety comes from the reality that this sort of reuse is something that you can't control and something that you must at least implicitly embrace. As John Seeley Brown and Paul Duguid have written, Web-based resources have taken on the role of shared cultural objects, as people exchange links as a way of sharing experiences. Even if you're not trying to foster a community online or using an existing Web 2.0 site or relying on a social media strategy, your data, collections, metadata, and the like are all linkable, harvestable, and reusable by the online community writ large, whether you like it or not. If, even if you have an image gallery without tagging, commenting, and so forth, with very explicit right statements, you were making those images available to the online community writ large. In my mind, another part of the fear sur surrounds people abusing your institutional identity, misappropriating your content, and ignoring these right rights issues surrounding your material. Yet, for all the fear, uncertainty, and doubt that surrounds this concern, there are people that you might think of as shadowy figures that disrespect your boundaries who may really be doing a positive service to your institutions and collections by adding value to them. Furthermore, they're not just adding value on your behalf, but on the behalf of that online community writ large. As Yochai Benkler suggests in his book, The Wealth of Networks, negative responses to this sort of work can burden free speech in general and impede the freedom of anyone anywhere to provide information relevance and accreditation. Explicitly embracing this sort of reuse is an appropriate response. Clever people will always find ways around whatever barriers there are, either intentional or unintentional. Well-intentioned people will find ways around these barriers and share the information and data with others. 
brilliant, well-intentioned people will work around barriers, share the resulting information, and document their process, allowing others to explore the process of obtaining information for themselves. At this point, I'd like to describe a few cases involving New York Public Libraries and digital materials that should serve as positive examples to this kind of reuse. As I've ex as stated in the disclaimer at my, the beginning of my presentation, my discussion of these examples should not be necessarily construed as an endorsement by the New York Public Library. My first example is a, a mashup created by Paul Hagen, a web developer at the National Library of Australia. His mashup, called New York Then and Now, uses images that the New York Public Library posted to Flickr Commons in a set entitled Changing New York 1935 to 1938. Our images did not contain any geolocation metadata. However, the titles of the images often contain street addresses, which Hagen then passed through Google's geocoding API to return latitude and longitude coordinates. Hagen then stores this information in a format understood by the Google Maps web service and then links the position of the image on the overview map to the Google Maps Street View image for that location. Hagen has also done this with, other, with digital materials from the National Library of New Zealand and the State Library of New South Wales and the Powerhouse Museum. My second example is the work of artist Joshua Heinemann. Heinemann's ongoing project, Reaching for the Out of Reach, repurposes digital, uh, digitized stereoscopic postcards from the New York Public Library's collections. Heinemann crops the two images and stereograms into separate files and then combines them into an anim animated image that oscillates between the two images. This oscillation gives the viewer the perception of the, st the stereoscopic, stereoscopic image in much the way that holographic stereograms work. For this, for example, from this image, Hagen then merged, these, merged the two images into this image. Unfortunately, I can't show you the animated version of this, so if you'd like to see it, um, I'll, I will give you the link. My last example is the work of Derek Coetzee, who's an administrator on Wikipedia and will be starting as a PhD student in computer science at Berkeley. Coetzee, along with other Wikipedia editors, discovered the large number of images that the New York Public Library makes available from, the New York, from our digital gallery. Coetzee determines how to gain access to the high resolution versions of the images programmatically and has pulling them, been pulling them in directly from our service, doing some post-processing and then uploading them to Wikimedia Commons. As one might expect, we discovered that our service, servers were experiencing a high amount of traffic once we discovered Coetzee's process, an NYPL staff member reached out to him, giving him suggestions about pulling a specific set of images, 40,000 available from the Robert N. Dennis st collection of stereoscopic views. I hope to see the library work with him and other Wikipedia editors in the future to take an organized approach to making our collections more widely accessible before we could. In conclusion, I ask you to think about the benefits of the, that these dedicated individuals could bring to your digital, digitally published materials. Archivists can leverage the spirit of co cooperation in the online community at large as a tool to assist them in, with making their materials more widely available, and potentially even to assist the promotion of both collections they hold and the institutions for which they work. Thank you for your time.